mentioned Williams and his contributions and how he was seen by his contemporaries and those who came after uh, George Washington Williams. But I wanted to revisit this or visit this again um, next session. We talked about him being praised as the greatest historian of the race in the 19th century and those in the early 20th century. Uh, we don't have time today, but I, I want to share with you some of the works of, of, of uh, William Nell that some of you raised. I think it's an important question. So I look a little bit more closely at what uh, Woodson said about some of the early historians. So he, he did, as, you, as a few of you correctly said, he does mention Williams, uh, Cooper Nell, but he also went and mentions uh, um, uh, William Wells Brown as well. So I want to share with you the works of these individuals. We'll take a quick look at it, and let's look at their method, uh, their research methods. Because one thing about Carter G. Woodson, he's very meticulous. And he really was, uh, as a matter of fact, something about Carter G. Woodson, mm -hmm. the man simply worked all the time. He never married. He was married to his work. And he was absolutely driven, uh, great Woodson. So a lot of his thoughts are very interesting. So I think it's important to come back to this. I want to show you the works of Nell and also William Wells Brown. We want to see why uh, Carter G. Woodson mentioned them. I don't want to uh, really discount what you said last week because it's an important contribution. I asked the question, who was the first historian? And uh, then we have to look at what is a historian, <laughs> as I mentioned last week, to say who, who, is, who has mastered the research techniques. So I don't know if you all have seen this, but the Negro in our history this was, uh, this was the fundamental textbook that people use across the country regarding black folks in the U.S. Until uh, um, John Hope Franklin's book, uh, From Slavery to Freedom, replaced it some decades later. But this is the fundamental text that people across the board looked at. Um, so I want to you know, go back to that. So we'll, we'll talk about Nell uh, next session. But we ended last class, I said I wanted us to look at the African continent and what these writers and historians have said about the three classical African civilizations, which are Kush, Nubia, and Kemet. And they actually ar ar uh, arose in that order. And as we indicated last week, is, I think it's much more important to say classical African civilizations and not simply ancient because of what classical means. It's the standard by which everything else is judged. So you have classic departments and they focus around the Western world and they focus only on Europe, so which is bogus. So that's why we say classical African civilizations are not simply ancient. And so when we talk about these civilizations, we know about the most enduring of all the monuments, pyramids. And they stun the world even now. And this is the oldest stone monument in the world going back to about 27, 2800 before the Common Era. So this, this is a part of the classical tradition, and this is the so-called Step Pyramid of Saqqara. These are people here, just to give you an idea of the size. I know some of you have gone to Kemet, but if you haven't, this is a 200-foot tall monument, and these people, you say, I don't really see them, but that's the point I'm making. They're insignificant. So we don't just use the term lightly. So there's a whole series of pyramids before we even get to the, the pyramids of Giza which are, and this one here by Khufu is the largest of them, 48 story uh, monument, and this is 47 stories, and this is about 20, almost 22 stories high. So Khufu, Khafre, Menkara are at the head of the class when we talk about accomplishments in the world. And these here, I'm just pointing out insignificant people. And look at the smaller pyramids. They're not small. Mm -hmm. They're simply smaller. Mm -hmm. And these are for family members. So this is what we're, we're looking at when we're looking at the great African tradition. This is why we must call these classical African civilizations. And we know more about Kemet in the north than we do about the southern lands. And that's what I want us to focus on, the southern lands, because the civilization spread from south to north. And this obviously is geometry on a very sophisticated scale. This is math at its best. It's math demonstrated. It's practical math. So enough of this... Uh, Pythagoras nonsense, a squared plus b squared plus c. So the Pythagorean theorem is really the Amos theorem, because the scribe Amos is the one that documented this on the oldest document that we can pinpoint, which is in the British Museum today, and goes back to about 1600 before the Common Era. And when planes fly over above, we can see the aerial view. And this is the greatest statue on Earth, Haru M. Akit, or Haru in the Horizon, so-called um, the Great Sphinx. 
And then, but there's pyramids further south in a place called Bagwawea. People say these are pyramids in Mayro. They're near Mayro. And the great Chancellor Williams talked about the capital city of <coughs> Mayro, which may have had 20,000 20, to 25,000 inhabitants. So this is near Mayro, but they're actually in Bagwawea. Just like when I travel abroad, as some of you probably do, if somebody says, where are you from? Uh, I'm in the San Francisco area. I mean, you call them Oakland. I mean, people wouldn't necessarily know where that is. So, same thing. This is near Mayro. These, the whole pyramid field of kings, queens, and high officials. So there's uh, also the pyramids of Nuri. There's at least four major pyramid sites further south, up south in Sudan. So this must be called classical African civilization. You have jewelry that uh, is stunning, even now. You have Het Heru sitting on her throne with the Ankh symbol. Look at the craftsmanship involved. Uh, beautiful to say the least, and then these classic images, you see these on bags, on t-shirts, and but miss, many people misunderstand and say these are Kushite, I'm sorry, Nubian princes, it's, no, it's not nothing to do with Nubian, these are earlier Kushite uh, princes, you see the crowns, look at the almond shaped eyes, mm -hmm. the beautiful black and brown color variation to show contrast, look at the jewelry, the sandals, here you have a leopard skin outfit that you find even now throughout East Africa, even now, and then rings of gold. And when you see three of anything, it means uh, plural. It means a lot. So you got plural, plural. And then you have the Nebu symbol, which means gold. And notice the three, the three uh, dots or marks there indicating plurality. And the area now is today. Sudan is is an area that's uh, is is in the midst of a gold rush, literally. It's literally a gold rush now. Everywhere in the north, you see people mining for gold. So anyway, I wanted to uh, mention the first of these classical uh, African civilizations, which is Kush. And these are some of the early writers on ancient Kush. You have the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire, published by Drusilla Dunja Houston in 1926. This is really uh, the first full volume dealing with... Uh, a classical African civilization. And Dungey Houston, she was writing in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, with very little resources. Now, in 1926, this is the still a Jim Crow era, so there's strict racial segregation, and she had a very difficult time finding materials or being able to access materials and check them out of the library because they wouldn't allow her to check out any materials. So Drusilla Dungey Houston had to to uh, work around the country to find buyers, but this was pioneering work. And then also we wanted to today speak about the great William Leo Hansberry as well. He didn't write books, but his student, Joseph Harris, published the, Af the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook. And then volume one, uh, sorry, volume two, is Africa and Africans as seen by so-called classical writers. They mean the Greeks and Romans. What was the name of the person in the notebook? Um, the, the William Leo Hansberry African History, African History Notebook, notebook that his um, student compiled. And then later, so this was uh, published in the uh, early 80s, and then, but Hansberry was doing the work in the early 20th century, just never published the work. So we'll talk about them, th these two individuals. And John Jackson, we won't be able to get to him today, but he published an important pamphlet in 1939, Ethiopia and the Origin of Civilization. So the Greeks didn't know anything about African na names, African languages, everything was changed. So Kush was changed to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia means burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. And so when somebody says that ancient people weren't focused on color, then tell them to just be quiet and stop spreading <laughs> this information. They were very much focused on color because they were looking at the skin tone. Yeah. I've been curious about something. Whenever I look at the, the uh, glyphs for a Kush, it says Kush. But I never, I never hear the word pronounced that way. Do you have any idea how it became Kush? Uh, With the U? Yes. Uh, just, you know, just stylistic. It's, it's uh, just usage? Yeah, just usage. Yeah. Modern usage, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. But you're right, in, in, uh, technically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> so... And I know that you, you want, I'm going to get you the email on this, when the, the Ethiopia was applied. So, but this is applied to the modern country, but that's not the area of ancient Kush. It's much broader than that. It's the whole region. So we want to discuss these today. And let's first start. If you want to see these, I'll pass some of these around. This is uh, uh, Jackson's book there. And um, who is this individual? 
This is uh, Gisela Dungey Houston, and uh, her family is the uh, the Dungey family, who were journalists and newspaper publishers. So they they published the Black Dispatch out of Oklahoma, and the Black Dispatch was a prominent black newspaper in the uh, in the uh, in, in the early 20th century. So the only outlet, or one of the few outlets that Drusilla Judge Houston had to publish her work on African civilizations was her family paper, The Black Dispatch. And, um, be, and, and in fact, so what she and other people were responding to, people like George Reisner, this outrageous person from Boston who went to Kemet, who went to current Sudan looking for a white queen. Of course, he was unsuccessful in finding her, but that was the man's objective. <laughs> and Reisner uh, researched in the area from 1907 to 1932, so that's a quarter century. And so Houston and others were responding to these white uh, so-called Egyptologists who wrote African people out of their own story. We were disconnected from our own history, so they were responding to this worldwide <laughs> propaganda. Yeah. But, you know, it seems to me that in some National Geographic magazines some time back, they stated that Cleopatra was white. Yeah. That, that she, mm -hmm. is that correct? You know, like I... Which like, one? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the seven. <laughs> the seven of them. Yeah, the Which one? <laughs> well, you could, well, first of all, uh, people have argued this point, but she seems to have some mixed ancestry. But if you, but there are, there's a couple of images of her. And clearly, she was, uh, to me, she, she was, she had mixed parents, African and probably Grecian. And, uh, but people have argued that point, though. Yeah. Didn't they just recently, when the disco discovery of her sister's body, uh, you're talking about the Cleopatra that was, uh, uh, was, was with Mark Anthony? Yeah, that the okay. over Kim. Uh -huh. uh huh. So. Um, Recently, there was a, a discovery that was in the newspapers, and was uh, because they still wanted Cleopatra to be white, and they have wanted her to be white. But the discovery of her body and her sister's body, the sister that she helped to have killed, uh, the discovery of her sister's body, and and um, announced was announced that the sister was actually Negroid. And so that the implications <laughs> for Cleopatra. Oh, didn't anybody hear about that? Was yeah, a big I missed it. So yes. now, so recently with DNA testing and all of that, it's a known fact that Cleopatra was of African ancestry since well, this discovery. Yeah, what I would say is that we have to look at those claims because you have, uh, there's some records of her ancestry, there's images of what she looked like too. Okay. So we have to look at all of that evidence. But I would say this, that, that uh, Cleopatra is unimportant. Mm -hmm. The only reason we know about her is because somebody tried to make her white. What did she contribute? Nothing. Mm -hmm. The same thing with Nefertiti. What did she do? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Somebody tried to make her white when they created this fake and phony bust of her in 1912. Mm -hmm. And so well, the reason why we know about those two women is that they've been passed off as European women. What about the great Tetashiri, mm -hmm. who everybody in the 18th dynasty saw as their great ancestors, who made a profound contribution? What about the other uh, female rulers and leaders and priestesses who made a profound contribution? Uh, what about Amenardias and others? So when we look at the end of, so, so Cleopatra comes along when there is no more Kemet. The dynastic system had already ended. So you have a foreign period. So, but that's what happens is that when we don't put things in what I would say the most important context, which is historical context, that we may focus on things that are really side issues, is just historical tri historical trivia, which has nothing to do with central questions. Hmm. Nothing to do with central questions. But, but I agree, it is something to look at. I don't dismiss it. But certainly that shouldn't be a, a discussion that is more important than the women that were front and center. What about Queen T? What about the great Nefertari, the, the, the wife of Ramses the Great? What about her elaborate structures? What did Cleopatra do? Sleep with different people and all this, <laughs> you know, so <coughs> that she did for political reasons. But nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation that comes along long after Kemet is already gone. There's no more Kemet. Now you have literally Egypt, because it's a Greek period. Uh, wh why was... Um do you have any information as to why um, the 
Tawasret was buried in the Valley of the Kings as opposed to the Valley of the Kings. Uh, Tawasret, yeah, in KV 14, mm -hmm. Kings Valley Tomb mm -hmm. 14. Uh, yeah, but she, she was a female ruler in the 19th dynasty. Mm -hmm. So Tawasret was, was buried in the Valley mm -hmm. of the Kings. Uh, Hatshepsut was buried in the Valley of the Kings. Mm -hmm. So you have five female rulers and buried, buried in the, with, no, we have five female oh, rulers yeah. total. Right, right, right. And uh, Hatshepsut buried in the Valley of the Kings. She was the fourth mm -hmm. female ruler in the 18th dynasty. Mm -hmm. And Tawasret mm -hmm. was buried in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, and she's the, the fifth and final of the five female rulers in Kemet. Mm -hmm. So that's why she was buried in the Valley of the Kings. So uh, this might be kind of small, but anyway, so Drusilla Houston lived from 1876 to 1941. Now, one of the things, and you know, it's, it's not my, <laughs> it's not really my usage. It's like in the old days, the some of the publishing didn't go very well. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is the wonderful Ethiopians in the ancient Kushite Empire. So I, I uh, this was published actually by Paul Coates in Black Classic Press in Baltimore. And uh, back around 85, I think, he published this, uh, this work of, of, uh, of, uh, of Houston. Yeah, I think it was 1985. And uh, Paul Coates, uh, you know, he, he's still in Baltimore. So anyway, uh, this is her book. And so until recently, this is all we knew about. This is volume one. But she indicates that volume two and three were already published. But nobody had these works. So he has a note in here about the lost works of Drusilla Dungey Houston. And she was absolutely unforgiving with those people who were misrepresenting African history. So in 1926, she makes an important uh, contribution. And so, uh, yes, and so let me just say that, uh, so I'll pass this around, but anyway, so it's a couple of volume, a couple of pieces here. But anyway, so she wrote the one, now notice she's using both terms, the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire. And so uh, this was the first of a multi-volume work published by Houston. So she started the work, even though it was published in 1926, from her writings, it seems as though she was working on this as early as 1906. So it was a 20-year project to publish volume one. And then she said, you know what, I'll take another 10 years to publish volume two. But she recognized she could be researching forever and never published. So finally she published, but she had to travel around the country and visit libraries that would allow black people to be able to access the library and check out books. Mm -hmm. So typically in the early 20th century, what the method was is really pretty much to read works written by other people. So it wasn't to really go and do field mm -hmm. research. That's, uh, that wasn't really something that was used as a way to get information. It would just glean, they would glean through various texts and pull together a story by picking and pulling from different sources, but she's one of the pioneers. And um, so a lot of her contemporaries were people like W.E.B. Du Bois. And she wrote, as a journalist, she wrote in the Crisis, which is the NAACP's paper. She wrote in the Pittsburgh Courier, but the main one was the Black Dispatch. So she knew for her book to really get out there, she needed a review from somebody prominent, like Du Bois. And Du Bois wouldn't review the book. <laughs> So she continued to write him and write, because Du Bois had a good relationship with her brother, uh, Roscoe Dungy, who was the publisher of the Black Dispatch newspaper. So she felt no problem to contact Du Bois directly and ask him to write a review of the book, but he wouldn't. So people were writing different things, a lot of criticism, like in fact, Joel A. Rogers. J. Rogers criticized the book, uh, others criticized the book. They gave her credit for writing a, a major work, but uh, but she was self-trained. And so people uh, recognize that there's some things she didn't know. Joel A. Rogers was self-trained too. And what he was attacked for is just not being able to evaluate the quality of sources. So that's why all of us, we, uh, we get these did you know emails that are preposterous many times. And the reason why people forward them is they say, this sounds strange, but if it's true, I want people in my, in my network to have the information. You know, like if you forward this to 10 people, then you're going to be, if there's some beta test by, uh, who is this guy, the <laughs> Microsoft guy? <laughs> by, uh, Gates. By, by Gates. By Gates. Mm -hmm. And that he's going to pay people for mm -hmm. involved. This is kind of, so people say it sounds strange. How would they know? I don't know. He's in computers. So maybe he will track all the emails I sent out and send me my check. This kind of silliness. People say, I don't know if it's real, but I better do it anyway because it might reap some dividends. Anyway, so uh, 
not being able to evaluate sources is why in the internet age we get all these crazy emails. But people did criticize her. Others praised her work as well. Uh, in fact, Arthur Schomburg, the great bibliophile, the Schomburg Center in New York, praised her work, but she was hard pressed to get a review. And she was left out by, uh, by uh, people like uh, Carter G. Woods, didn't mention her. So uh, that's why I want to revisit Nell because I do know that uh, there are politics in any arena. So let's take a look and see what it is that's there. So we notice he published two other volumes. Now, volume two, volume two in the Drusilla uh, Dungeon Houston series on ancient Kush, and this is truly pioneering work, is entitled Origin of Civilization from the Kushites. Now, it wasn't found and published until, guess when, uh, 2007. So um, Peggy Brooks Bertrand. She did her PhD work on pursuing Drusilla Dunja Houston. So she actually published volume two, 2007. Who was her name? Uh, Peggy Bertrand, I'm sorry, uh, Peggy Brooks Bertrand. I'll pass this around, but this is book two. So the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire, book two, Origin of Civilization from the Kushites. So now keep in mind, she wrote the original work in 1926. So for decades, the work had been lost. Nobody knew where these volumes were, but they were sure that she published volume two and three because she makes consistent references to them. And she had plans to publish several more volumes. But this is volume two, and um, that was, uh, that was published. Yes. Where was that volume originally found? That's a good question. Uh, I might have missed something there, but I, uh, she doesn't really give all the details. She doesn't give all the details, so I would have to go and look at her dissertation to see because mm -hmm. that's a good question because things just don't pop up. Right. They're found yeah. somewhere, in some archive or yeah. some uh, family uh, trunk or case, mm -hmm. and somebody didn't know what it was, but they don't just pop up. So that uh, <laughs> is a good that's a good question. She doesn't really <laughs> address that unless I overlook something. I don't think I did without. So just she found it. Where exactly? So that's a uh, question. And what Drusilla Dunsey Houston said was this. This is, uh, she's challenging people. She said, out of anthropology, ethnology, geology, paleontology, archaeology, as well as history, I have dug up an irrefutable arsenal of facts that Harvard or Yale or cowardly scholarship in our <laughs> race dare not refute. Who you think you're dealing with here? <laughs> and she says, uh, "How can a leadership point the forward way that is utterly ignorant of the past?" Wow. So oh, she's challenging right. people with pioneering <laughs> work. Now, and now here, her contentions are this. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I only got to put the map in here. But her contention is that civilization spread. Let me do, let me uh, say advanced civilization, because to assume that the small stature people are not civilized, that's a, that's, that's a dangerous Western concept. These small stature people, the Ife, the Mbuti, the San, the Koi, these people live in complete harmony with their environment. They have two great laws. They have the, the ethical laws among themselves, but they also have great ecological laws. Do unto nature as you would have nature do unto you. Yeah. They can live in an area for two weeks as hunter-gatherers, and leave and you never know they were there. How can that not be civilized? I mean, to me, civilization should be focused on the quality of the relationship among people and between people in their environment, not just grand structures. So she's talking about advanced civilization, not just civilization. How can we uh, just dismiss these, these earlier people? So Houston, her contention basically is that advanced civilization spread from the Northeast African region uh, across the Red Sea as far east as India. That's her contention, that all of this was ancient Kush. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not to be dismissed out of hand. We really should look at it, because if you look at India, and you have the Hindu Kush mountains, you have names like Kish in the area, you know, Brother David was mentioning vows, vows change. You know, I, O, whatever, or you, no big deal there. We don't always know because some languages never wrote with vowels. You can only, you can only, uh, you know, make an estimated guess of what vowels are until we analyze other uh, comparative languages. But she argues that the civilization as far east as India was all Kush. 
And that's where marijuana comes from today. So young cats, <laughs> when they say Kush, when you say the civilization of Kush, <laughs> they, they, they think you're talking about marijuana public. Yeah. They say, no, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about the civilization of Kush. That's all they know. But her contention is that all of that was Kush. And remember, um, okay, so that's, that's an interesting thesis. It's an interesting thesis. What I would say is that we can comfortably say that Kush was in the northeast Area, a northeast area of Africa across the Red Sea and the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. But going further east to India, uh, that has to still be proven. It really does. Otherwise, we will may fall uh, into this, as uh, we've mentioned before, um, this diffusionist theory that you know that civilization spreads from one source and one source only. And people are just uh, sitting around with no knowledge of anything, and somebody has to come and teach them. Now for what? We, we don't even need that. That's unnecessary. But um, so this is a theory that was that was that was created by the white supremacists, and they still promote this. So I don't know. Um, but uh, not to dismiss what she says out of hand, but uh, I don't see proof that all of that was pushed. So the work still has to be done. It still has to be done. But that was her contention. So she opened this up, and I think that. For her to write in such a uh, comprehensive manner about Kush being the oldest of the advanced civilizations is an important topic. It really is. That has to be further looked at. And so uh, that's what happens. You have pioneers that make uh, comments or reach conclusions, and, and those details should be. So like, uh, so like this sister here has followed Houston for all these years and has published a work. Now, yes, bro. Even though. You have some questions about it going as far as India. Are there any scholars that have written it to refute what you've had to say? Well, but you have to, uh, there's nothing to refute if there's no evidence, per okay. se. So in other words, um, just because she's made the claim doesn't make it so. Just because other people have repeated it, and they have, it doesn't make it so. Uh, and it has been repeated. So when I created the map of Kush, um, that's why I don't go as far as India because I don't want to be out there relying on a work from almost a century ago. And by the way, one criticism of her book, no bibliography, no footnotes, no index. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, that, the, the, the second volume published has a bibliography and has footnotes. So with volume two, she does meet the standard with volume two and has a bibliography, for, but not volume one. So... Uh, I don't think, brother, that people have even taken her work serious enough to even tackle the question of looking at her process. Is it, you usually have two camps. You either have African-centered folks that will just embrace it without any evaluation, and you got the, the anti-African folks that will dismiss anything that they can, mm -hmm. and not really an honest assessment of really where uh, her scholarship is. But I think that... To do that in Oklahoma, which is not a major center, <laughs> that's important. So if she had financial issues. How are you going to travel around the country? Even now, that would be a challenge. Traveling around the country to, because you know you can get things from an archivist, and they work with you. Because a lot of the archivists and librarians are lonely. I found that they're lonely. <laughs> so if they can get a visitor, it's a good day. Because they, they're dealing with you know papers all day or artifacts. So to get a, a actively Interested visitor, and I, I found that wherever I've been, that they're excited by that to deal with a person. <laughs> so, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is something that has to be pursued. It really is, and I, I'm interested in, in doing that. Yeah. Uh, well, so two two points. Um, back to the word name Cush. Um, I know in the Bible uh, it's been said that uh, that name the name Cush appears in uh, na name and place people's names and place names throughout, but in varying spelling because of the vowels, and that is usually an indicator that uh, there is some African ancestry or some connection to uh, uh, African migration. But also, uh, wouldn't the, um, the evidence of uh, African migrations in Papua New Guinea and various places in Southeast Asia and Australia indicate that that would still a, that would be a possibility? for um, India to be settled by uh, uh, African migration? 
But when we know India was settled by yeah. us, and you have the Dalit or the Dravidian, right. so we know that there's an original African population right. there right. that were destroyed by the Aryans when they came through the Khyber Pass, right. you know, about right. 1500 BCE. But um, to just connect it automatically with with Kush the northeast part of Africa. the empire. Yeah, 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 part of the part same of empire. empire. That's the only yeah. damn question. Yeah. But the migrations are set. Okay. The fact that okay. the original people there, I don't think that's uh, yeah. African. Yeah. It's not much of an argument, I don't mm -hmm. believe, but but uh, we have to prove it. We have to prove that. And just like some people say that all the martial arts in Asia, all of them, karate, kung fu, you name it, were, it came from Kemet. Okay, <laughs> based on what? Well, you know, our martial arts in Kemet are older than the ones in Asia, so therefore the ones in Asia came from Kemet. They taught them. Okay? Nice thesis. You know, as a researcher, I'm at, I ask the basic question, how do you know? <laughs> Oh, well, Africans were in Asia first. Well, how do you know? I mean, you can't just say everything these people have ever learned has come directly from Kemet. I agree that the scenes in Kemet are older than the martial arts tradition in Asia, but you have to at least be logical about it. So you have to at least show uh, direct or at least indirect contact. How are they going to learn what? Through osmosis? When did they contact each other? Either direct or indirect. And people haven't even, who argue this, they haven't even taken to that step. So it's not even a logical argument. That's why the diffusionist theory is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because it assumes that nobody can ever do anything. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody, and this is what's been imposed on us. Mm -hmm. But Houston's theory is, uh, is, is good. But she definitely talks about Kush. And you notice she's mentioning both Kush and Ethiopian in the, in the, in the title. Mm -hmm. So she knows. So I just want to introduce you to an early pioneer, even though she was left out of the works of a lot of the writers, such as Du Bois. Uh, I think he later commented on her work, and it wasn't all that positive. Uh, Woodson never even addressed her work. And so um, and so now we have volume two. So anyway, um, and we saw her, her quote. Also, um, I showed you this last week, Diop and William Leo Hansberry. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's Hansberry. Let's look at him first. Hansberry, uh, many call the father of African studies, and Hansberry was clearly a pioneer. He didn't write. He didn't write, so as I in indicated, his student Joseph Harris edited and published his work, the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook, Volumes 1 and 2. Volume 1, Pillars in Ethiopian History. Volume 2, Africa and African as seen by classical uh, writers. And um, Hansberry is noted because of the fact that he was such a pioneer in the field that um, you know it, his professors didn't know what he knew. I mean, he went to Harvard, he got a degree, but the professors didn't, they couldn't give him his PhD examination because they didn't have the questions to ask. They mm -hmm. didn't know. You have to know something about the subject to really engage the subject. So, But what Hansberry is really noted for, among many things, is that he founded in 1922 the African History section, I'm sorry, the African um, Civilization section of the History Department at Howard University. And when he founded that in 1922, very few people on Howard University's campus, uh, Brother Shane Go, had no respect <laughs> for the discipline. They thought this man was teaching a, uh, a backward subject, a subject that was not a proper academic uh, subject. So he was ridiculed on his own campus. And um, but he taught, he immediately taught three courses, and two of the courses that Hansberry taught were the ancient civilizations of Ethiopia and Negro peoples in the cultures and civilizations of prehistoric and protohistoric times. Hmm. So these are two of the courses he taught beginning back in 1922. Hmm. And um, he had some of the most illustrious students, such as Chancellor Williams and others, Joseph Harris. Chancellor Williams, he was affected by uh, Anambi Azikwe, the first president of independent Nigeria, who had offered, Azikwe offered to publish the works of Hansberry. And John Henry Clark was one of his students, I think. Uh, I don't know about Ad Howard, but he, he certainly would have learned from them, there's no question. They would have had association as well. Yes? Um, I got this article from the gentleman published by Cadillas. And it said, they say that it is time for Howard University to recognize the <laughs> immense contributions of Hansberry by organizing a major conference and by naming the Department of African Studies William Leo Hansberry, Department of African Studies. That's a good suggestion, I would agree. And it, yeah, it goes on to say, like, 
Uh, no, they haven't. Now, see, um, Hansberry passed in 1965. He worked uh, up until 59 in Howard, but he passed in 65. He wasn't still not recognized by Howard. Mm -hmm. He still wasn't recognized. And Hansberry was not honored until the 50th year anniversary of the founding of the African Civilization Section. So he wasn't honored by Howard until 1972, so it was posthumously. The man had already passed away. And this wasn't initiated by Howard, it was his students. Mm -hmm. It was Chancellor Williams and a lot of other students who had the 50th anniversary to honor Howard. Wow. And since they had it at Howard, and Howard tried to get in in the festivities as if they were pro Hansberry, they were not. They were anti Hansberry. Many people have been run out of Howard, had a difficult Nathan time. Here. Nathan Hare. Yeah. Nathan Hare. Nathan Hare. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, and um, and uh, Francis Crest Wilson. A lot of people have had problems at the so-called mecca of black institutions. As a matter of fact, when I was at Morgan State down the street in 1980, in 1985, we I organized a petition to make African history a requirement so that every student who matriculates at Morgan and for them to get a degree, they had to take a course to act on the African diaspora. And they have to take their course today because I let that petition drive starting in April of 1985, and it just so happened at the same time, students at Howard had the same identical campaign. Mm -hmm. All we asked for was just one course. Mm -hmm. that why can't a student learn something about themselves? Now this is going to be some, here going back to the 1920s, I mentioned this is 1985, mm -hmm. and they're still uh, fighting mm -hmm. this idea. But Hansberry is a pioneer because he understood the antiquity of Kush, or what he was calling Ethiopia, using a Greek term, but he went to Oxford to study. Mm -hmm. Because the people in Oxford, they knew a little bit more than some of the people at Yale and Harvard in the mm -hmm. 1930s, and then he goes and does field research. Mm -hmm. So he really lays out what the pattern should be, what the process should be. You do the archival work, the library work, and then go and do the field work, and that's what he did. So Hansberry is a true pioneer, but Howard Stewart is not really honored. That would be a great contribution to really honor him and with the, like like the library, uh, it's a Moreland Springhorn library. Why not add Hansberry with that or the history department or that, or something, but they don't. But it was his students who honored him in 1972 and not really the university. But his work, he's looking at, and I don't think, uh, but anyway, um, I think I brought that. But anyway, with Hansberry, he's arguing also that Ethiopia came first, or, uh, or Kush. It came first. So this is an early pioneer back in the 1920s who's teaching this. And he had conferences <coughs> as well. And the conferences that he had on ancient civilizations, it's clear that Drusilla Dunn and Houston would have been aware because they were contemporary, but there's no evidence that she was there um, and gave a paper. But she certainly would have known about it. But Hansberry, you know, his most prominent, one of his most prominent students is uh, Dr. Chancellor Williams. And Williams um, wrote The Rebirth of African Civilization in 1961. We don't really know when Chancellor Williams was born. People will put 19, uh, 1898. That's just because of usage, as, as you say. Because we don't really know. There's different dates. On his obituary, it's a different date. In the Washington Post newspaper, when he passed away, it's a different year. There's always different years. And so the photographer of Chancellor Williams, who knew his family really well, he contacted me, I don't know, maybe about four years ago because he had saw some of my work on YouTube and I had used one of his photographs. But it was in public domain. I just went to Google Images and so <laughs> I was trying to find out where this photo came from. It was a photo of Chancellor Williams, John Henry Clark, and Dr. Ben. And I didn't know where that was. Yeah, it was a famous image. So I said, hey, it's a nice one. So I do a presentation. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where, when, you know. I, I knew it was authentic, but I didn't know anything about where and the context. So he contacted me and said, look, brother, I, I, I respect your work, appreciate your work, uh, and that's, but that's my photograph. You can continue to use it, but just give me credit. <laughs> and the next thing I know, he sends me an email with about 10 more photographs that he took. That, so his name is Augie Ogborn, and Augie Ogborn is not only a student, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, a, uh, and it's, he's assisted Chancellor Williams, but he was official photographer mm -hmm. for Chancellor Williams. And he's, he's still in the D.C. area. Um, and you look him up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, uh, he's got a lot of interesting records of Chancellor Williams even now. I don't, uh, 
think his last name is spelled like that, but but he uh, he's still around, and we met. He showed me a lot of interesting things. Like he has the he still has like the grocery list, but when he would take chance away him to the grocery store, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? yeah, and then he's got the original height. Uh, manuscript with Chancellor Williams' uh, handwriting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he and you know he's he's not a, so he's uh, you know to him it's not the biggest thing in the world, but he's pretty good at keeping notes. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at this. That's okay, well, brother. This would have been between this year and this year because he's making a reference here that clearly indicates the time period. And it's, oh man, y'all his stories are something else. <laughs> well, it's exciting, brother. Yes. So. Um, if I understand correctly, um, Herskovitz was working during the same period, like early 1900s? 1940s and... Right, so, period. so um, concurrent with the work of the other historians that we're talking about, did they ever make commentary on his work? On Chester Williams' work? No, on, um, on Herskovitz's work. His European Different yeah. discipline. Yeah. 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 They, but they, 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 they were. I don't know that question specifically, but they were all were aware of, of published works. Right. So they're all responding. They are responding, and uh, and I know that I can't recall offhand, but I do remember someone making reference to it. But yes, yeah, influential work. Mm -hmm. It's a very influential <laughs> work, but they're responding. They really are. They're responding to all these works because the problem that the early 20th century African writers had is getting their work out. Who's going to publish it? How are you going to get it distributed? And they all had that that challenge. And know? I recognize that Herschel was an anthropologist, but um, um, uh, uh, Drusilla Dungy Houston pointed out that she referred to anthropology in her work. So I know that historians aren't necessarily working in a silo, and his history and anthropology are, you know, cousins. Mm -hmm. um, they they sort of ab abide in the same family. So so I assume that especially with all the research that he was doing and all the great stuff he was going and stealing and bringing back, there, there may have been, you know, an opportunity for yeah. him to be looking at what he was bringing back or, like, making commentary on his work or, like you said, responding. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know if they made any specific references to him. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure they Yeah, are. They, they all interact, <laughs> yeah. obviously, they, especially if they're contemporaries. Yeah. If, uh, you may be familiar with the debate between Herskovitz and Frazier. Oh, well, that's where you'll find the debate between us uh, on her first of it, his methods and his findings, and his contention that uh, you might even say today that there's survivals, African survivals, and I think they call them syncretisms as well, mm -hmm. and uh, adaptations what, what is uh, it? among African Americans, mm -hmm. which was very con contentious for someone who's a sociologist. Mm -hmm. That's really interested in. I was wondering, you know what rarely comes up? The two volume work by uh, uh, Sinclair Drake and Horace Cape. I mean, it's a huge work, and I, I believe it was written during the Depression, which is an important era, obviously, of this country's history. And I don't think there's anything like it. It's highly descriptive, but it covers Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, which he called Brownsville, uh, just to be catchy. And it's two very large works, but it, it, he's a uh, social anthropologist. Anthropology is what I think. Was he talking about the section of Chicago called Brownsville? Brownsville. Brownsville. Yeah. yeah. Brownsville. Is that name under uh, that section? Indeed. Mm -hmm. you know, indeed. indeed. I mean, he did a like, um, like Dubois did with Philadelphia. Greg and Caden did with Chicago. But it really comes out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Drake's book, um, uh, it's, 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 it's like to buy well, Yeah, he wrote that. And you know, something else that people may be familiar with, familiar with is a black folks uh, then and yeah, now. Then and now. Mm. And somebody got a copy of that at a garage sale for less than five dollars. Yeah, I'm not surprised. The person was totally on I don't know what. I said you must be. He's kidding. a fascinating <laughs> man. He was my mentor, in fact. Oh, really? Is that right? Many students, mentors. Okay. Uh, on the Stanford campus. Uh, but if you went to his office, there was always a line. The students waited. And when you got in, he really talked about what you were interested in <laughs> because he would take you all, all around the world. 
telling his stories, uh, his experiences. But he was not liked on the Stanford campus by the sociologists and anthropologists who, because for some reason, because he was associated with African American studies, he was the head of the mm -hmm. program. I uh, didn't think very highly of him, mm -hmm. as usual. Yeah, that's, that's common, you're right. So Chester Williams wrote a number of books, but I guess for our purposes he wrote The Rebirth of African Civilization in 1961, which was 10 years before he wrote the classic The Destruction of Black Civilization in 1971. That was the first edition. And the, the subtitle was Great Issues of a Race from 4500 B.C. to 2000 A.D. So he was projecting pretty much 20 years, I'm sorry, uh, almost 30 years in the future. 2000 AD. So Chancellor Williams, following the footsteps of his professor, who uh, is the great William Leo Hansberry, so he goes to Oxford, mm -hmm. and then he studies at Oxford, he takes classes there to learn about the colonial presentation on African civilizations, he studies under Professor Madden and others who as, were as anti-African as it gets, but Chancellor Williams did that, he goes to Oxford, goes to the libraries and uses it as a basis for field research in Africa, then in the 1950s. See, I had never seen, I had never seen when, when we say that Chancellor Williams went to 26 countries and did research among 105 different language groups in Africa, I've never known what those 26 countries were. I know a few of them, <coughs> but Augie Osborne has said, he said, Doc, have you seen the, so he, so he showed me clippings, he showed me clippings of uh, the countries he went to, he went to. The, uh, what he was publicizing, advertising, that the 26 countries Chancellor Williams went to, and that's very helpful to really get that list from the brother. And I said, man, you, you, uh, <laughs> you, need, to, you need to write a, uh, a piece. You need to really publish the photos. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got to follow up with him since we're talking, because I told him, we agreed, nobody's going to publish a serious, authentic biography of Chancellor Williams respectfully. I need to do it, but he's got the record. But I told him, I said, man, you got to publish these photos. You know. Uh, I said, I'll I don't. Talk to him. Okay, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Call his brother up and say, look, yeah, we've got enough. Right, this is, two, no, serious, this is 2013. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, and the brother's getting older. And uh, he's got the records. I mean, he, he he's kept meticulous records. He has the record, I guess, specifically of how many volumes of Chancellor Williams' book. He sent out um, to who, when he got all that. Mm. Not, not published. Not published. Why? Mm. He's got the records, but uh, he's, he's not going to publish. It. He's not mm. going to do it. Mm. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard. He went into law. Someone else. He said he, he he brought it up to give those to me. Mm. You yeah. know. So I need so, Tracy yeah. to, to call him. So <laughs> yeah, I'll need to work on that. <laughs> this needs to be done. Yeah. So look, it, it'll be a contribution, just like uh, the sisters made with Drusilla Dunsey Houston's work. It'll be the same kind of contribution. This is published in 2007. Yeah. 1926 to 2007? I mean, this is three quarters of a century. Mm -hmm. So there would be that kind of contribution. So uh, we need that done, Tracy. <laughs> There's just so much to do, you know. And if he, and if he's just tell him that you're calling from the offices. <laughs> uh, <doctor. laughs> yeah, you know. Let's, let's put some emphasis on. <laughs> okay, brother, we're gonna have to come out to DC and, uh, and, and, and talk to you in person. Let's try to work this out. Yeah, brother. Yeah, two uh, quick comments. Also, in House Council at the time, they, they did this thing for Leo Hansberry. Okay. And you can see there's a lot of tension that was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. It was going on. Mm -hmm. That the how true enough that we was back in it into it. Now, as far as Chancellor Williams, I mean, it was difficult for him to walk across campus because he would always have a flock of students with him trying to just talk to him, and he would, and he just didn't have like a big head. He would just take his time mm -hmm. <coughs> and just talk to you. So I really enjoyed being with him. Wow. And, uh, I, yeah. I didn't have a classroom. I just ordered a classroom. Everybody just tried to mm -hmm. get in his classroom when he would be uh, presented. Who else was teaching there um, in the department along with Chester Williams when you were there? You know, I, I was in the philosophy department. I oh, okay. really you know, didn't okay. remember the track. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, bro. That's good okay. information. Yeah. Um, this is just uh, when we were talking about um, Mr. Hansberry. That Hansberry received the highest civilian award 
first African research of working behavior still I see a first price uh, trust from the Ethiopian government in 1964 mm -hmm. and the Hanford <laughs> Institute of African Studies at the University of Nigeria in Nusuka, Nusuka a statement to Hanford's significance in the area of African studies and Howard University did not recognize no. that. No, that you know, just tells us why we're in the situation we're in. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. he, 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 you know why? You know why Howard didn't didn't really recognize it? They're because they're white. Yeah, that too. And, and the white yeah. benefactors yeah. didn't validate. It. That's yeah. what it comes down to, right? <laughs> so <laughs> these yeah. cats are safe. It's yeah. safe to dismiss yeah. Hansberry. Yeah. That's why they still say, you know what? We're going to have a celebration. Mm -hmm. Period. To honor the man. So Chancellor Williams does the research in the 1950s, and and this is when I saw the first. Ethi so he too understood the antiquity, the priority of Kush or Ethiopia. He's using the Greek term, but he's got a whole map here. He's got a whole map. So these these people knew about Kush being first. That's never discussed now, with rare exception. They we we think somebody's saying something when they talk about the in quotations the black pharaohs from Kush in the 25th dynasty. What about the other 24? And you know, somebody running around talking about the black pharaohs, this is deliberate misdirection and misinformation. Why are you talking about black pharaohs? We know by definition the pharaohs are black. Mm -hmm. So why are you talking about the 25th dynasty to, to, to suggest, strongly suggest that the other dynasties were not black? That's what it really comes down to. But this is new propaganda by these people. Uh, they don't know anything. There's no Kushology. They don't know. All they can talk about is an A group. Uh, they thought it was a B group and a C group. Right. Then they said the B group is linked to the C group. So now it's just A group and C group. What kind of discussion is that? They just talk about alphabetical letters, but they don't know. They don't know. They really don't, these people. So anyway, Chancellor Williams said all of this is the ancient Kushite Empire, or Ethiopian Empire. But what I thought was amazing here on page 63, he has Nubia as the southern part of Kush. And then Kemet as the northern part of this empire. This is amazing insight to see all of this as one united cultural complex. And the Kush being the oldest, and then and then as we go down north, Nubia emerging from a much vaster empire. Because it only makes sense. I, okay, I took this, so I go out in the field and, and took Chancellor Williams' premise, and it makes sense. You know why? Because when we see the historical record, when we see the writings, and we see the first images of the interaction between those in the, in the, in the south, the Kushites, and people who further in the north, there's, con there's political conflict. What are they fighting for? Jesse Williams said they're fighting for control of the much older Kushite empire. And what we see are battles that are taking place to establish new boundaries. What else would they be fighting for? I mean, it makes this very plausible. But what I found, I traced what this man is saying there's some other sources, and I found that this is the the most likely scenario. It makes it makes more sense than any other scenario, brother David. Uh, isn't it true that that uh, what is being referred to there as Nubia over uh, towards the Red Sea is actually the concentrated uh, deposits of gold uh, on which Kemet was for so long dependent? Yeah, the gold. gold mines abound over a vast area right to the left of the Red Sea. In this area? Yes, yeah. and Kemet is always dependent on that source of gold. Yeah, and, in the and, north. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and today, the, the gold rush today is in this uh, this area right here. I mean, it's literally a gold <laughs> rush. Yeah, I mean, huge mining camps, huge. So last, or in January, yes. we're driving, yeah. I thought this was these were towns. In both cases, I said, wow, okay. Because you know it's desert, there's no mm -hmm. signs, it's mm -hmm. difficult. So we're looking for, there's no roads, by the way. You make a road through the sand. <laughs> so I'm thinking that these are actual towns. If we get there, no, these are temporary mining camps. And these are foreign concerns that are coming in? And mining in some camps. cases, there's Italian concerns, but a lot of, uh, <coughs> but, but there's a lot of local prospectors, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of local prospectors that are looking for so anyway, this is Chancellor Williams' yeah. contribution, and that's why I put together what I believe is the, you know, the accurate map of Kush as far as we know right now. And this map here, it, uh, I think we can establish that. So this is the Northeast Africa region and across to the Red Sea, but this is the area of Old Kush, and the heartland is right here in the north. This is where you find the pyramids, the elaborate temples. You have the most elaborate development in this area, and Nubia emerges a little bit 
further down north and then eventually Kemet. Chancellor Williams understood that very well. Very well. Most people, uh, when you see maps, you know they don't know. They have, they have Nubia way down here. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Ancient and modern Nubia is in the same place. It's really in the northern area. But anyway, our goal is to uh, give more substance to this here, but it's really based on the understanding that Chancellor Williams lays out. So I'm, I, I know this was part of ancient Kush going back into the Stone Age, but keep in mind, Drusilla Houston says it goes even further to the east. So that's mm -hmm. a that's a contention we still has to look at. Uh, yes? Oh, he was first. Oh, okay. yep. no, I just had a quick question. What, what's the time frame? This is this is, this is 4,000 before the common era. This is map. No, no um, my question is, what is the time frame of uh, the py stone pyramids being built uh, in the Kush Nubia area as opposed to uh, Kemet. Uh, well, was it like immediately after or for a few centuries after? Or? It was a long time afterwards. The, the pyramids in Kemet start about 2700 right. or so BCE and they're building them up to the end of the 6th uh, the six, six, six dynasty. The ones in Kush are a couple thousand years younger. Right. However, that's the, that's the upper layer. That's all, that's all that's been done, is the upper layer of research. What about all that beneath? So, do you have any idea when the, the, the stone, the uh, mud brick uh, building began? In, uh, in, in either one of them? In, well, in the south, there's no way to put it there. Because yeah. okay. there's been no serious research. There's mm -hmm. people that can't even, the so-called best archaeologists, they don't even have, they can't even tell the difference between a tomb, a mastaba, and a pyramid. They don't mm -hmm. even know. There's a lot more work to be done, but uh, so the pyramids in the south, we're just looking at the upper layer, and and when all these dams are being built now, a lot of this is being flooded, so we'll never be able to really. Yeah, I know there's there's an opportunity for underwater archaeology, but certainly a lot of it will be damaged as this continues. But I want to get to yes. Well, I just wanted to ask you about um, uh, the um, criticism of Chancellor Williams. Oh yeah. For uh, many years mm -hmm. during my scholarship, especially at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I was um, dissuaded from using him as a reference. Yeah. It was only when I was doing some work here that I, uh, and under an African professor, that I chose to um, look at him and found him to be a treasure trove of information on classical Africa uh, and about the details of it and all of that. However, in his discussion, I find that he goes like way out without documenting. And I'm wondering, is that what people criticize? Yes. I was looking at that again today because he gets into this like evolved idea like he's looking right at what's going on, but he's not giving any documentation for that. Yeah, and uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. In fact, Chancellor Williams, uh, he addresses that. He addresses it because he, he said he had hundreds of footnotes. And he said he deleted the footnotes <laughs> right. <laughs> because he's doing pioneering work. So he deleted the footnotes to not give reference and credence to works that really didn't play as much of, they, they didn't really play a major part in his, his conclusions because he says that it was his work in 26 Nations collecting the oral history that gave him more insight than somebody else's work. But that is the main criticism of him, just like with Drusilla Dunn de Houston. He doesn't have any footnotes. And he explains why. And that's why looking at his contentions are very important. That's why I, I had this one of the book, books I had with me when I was traveling throughout Europe and field work in Africa to check what the Chancellor Williams had to say. And that's when I really came to the conclusion that this is a crazy insight. This insight could have only come from somebody doing the first hand research because his statements he makes that you're right, he's not documented in per se. So I didn't have to take his statement. He says that, that, that all we see here really between um, you know, Kush and, and, and Nubia, we see border conflict, Kemet. Okay, interesting statement, but then I'm looking at all these records, I said, oh man, this is crazy. This is absolutely, this is the only thing that really makes sense. Why are these Africans battling? You know, when you, and then he's talking about that you have foreigners from the north. So a lot of people think the first Europeans that come in uh, to Kemet area or the Greeks, no such thing. You, you find early images of them, just like Chancellor Williams said, like the Hunter's Palette. In the Hunter's Palette, when I first saw it, part of it is in the British Museum in London, the other part is in the Louvre in Paris. And the Hunter's Palette, you see hunters. 
that are hunting. This is about, it's dated to about 3500 BCE or 4000 BCE. And you take a look at it, these, are, these people, they look wild. They have on some, some tails, some horns. And you take a look at the, these are typical, what we would consider uh, uh, typical European features. You take a look at the nose. And, and so I called the British Museum uh, department. It was the end of the day when I really paid a close look at that. And I asked, I said, what, the Hunter's Palette, what can you all tell me about this? And so, uh, well, yeah, you know, we just figured it came from the south. It's not even the north. It came from the south. And they just, I said, what do you think happened to the population? They just assumed that it blended into the culture. But what Chancellor Williams said, and then I found some other things that made Chancellor Williams' ideas to me make even more sense because there are a group of people in Kemet that were permanent foreigners. They're the Rekiat or Rekiat people, and you see them represented always as bound captives. Sometimes they are shown symbolically as a lap winged bird with their wings always tied behind them, and they're, and they're always in like in a fortified area. Then there's text showing that they lived in fortified fort areas and they were they were allowed to uh, be transported from one fort to the other area to tr trade. Why they never kicked these people out, I don't know. But Chancellor Williams, is he didn't call them the permanent foreigners, but he does indicate Europeans being there at the foundation of Kemet. And even the Narma palette, the palette where Narma is unifying Kemet, you have on one side Africans fighting over border, border areas, and then you have on the reverse side, Norma has on his crown of the north, and you have a completely different ethnic or racial type. And I'm looking at Chancellor Williams and say he, he understood these things. He doesn't write about the details at all. Well, he, he does. Let me not say he doesn't write about the details. He doesn't document the details. Uh, but it makes perfect sense. So this is what I've been pursuing. And it's not reading. I, I've read anybody's work. Didn't need to. I've gone to, I've studied over a million artifacts, so from what I saw, what I can document, even for the digital age, I got these old 35 miller, mil, millimeter photographs, and I'm reading stuff like there's a person called Alessandra Nibby that, wrote, that publishes discussions in Egyptology. You don't find Alessandra Nibby's work in the mainstream because it's outside the box scholarship. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at all of these artifacts, and I'm just made a whole list of things that that uh, seem clear that they're supporting Chancellor Williams' contention. But anyway, that's a valid. Criticism, he doesn't use it, but he does address that point. I want to show you all something. Yes. A quick question. So, um, when you talk about doing pioneering work and not necessarily adding footnotes because you know it is pioneering work and it's much just based on observation, is there a movement towards documenting where the observations came from, like review of this scroll or, you know, um, interview given by? Baba Oye in whatever place, like you know that type of documentation, because it seems like that could still be documented. Just thinking about his, the historical process. Absolutely, no, you're, you're absolutely mm -hmm. correct. And, and one limitation of Chancellor Williams that he didn't read the Metro Nature. Mm -hmm. That's right. He mm -hmm. clearly didn't read it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the limitations. But his overall understanding, him being able to synthesize a large body, that's where he's uh, exceptional. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's where he's among the best of the best ever to write about this because he understood it and he shows it in his map. But that is a valid uh, issue to me, even if you're not quoting somebody else. That's why some of the works that we might tend to refer to, I don't see them as valuable at all. Like you got Swallowed and Lubus making all these claims. He's thoroughly anti-African. Show me a footnote. Allow me or anybody else to independently look at a, a, a scroll, as you say, or a temple wall, pyramid text or something. Allow us to independently look at the artifacts that you are right. allegedly basing your ideas on. We don't have to rely on you. So that's why I didn't rely on Chester Williams. I, well, actually I relied on him for a framework. But then it's that's where it stopped. Okay, then let's see where he's correct and where he might you know, need a little bit of help. So anyway, uh, time is moving, but um, he indicates that this is the greatest of all issues that the civilizations emerged in ancient Sudan and Egypt. And it goes back into the uh, beyond the reach of man. But I want to show you. So he talks about his field research, Chancellor Williams, and uh, and direct field work is the highest investigation. So Chancellor Williams is also a important pioneer dealing with Kush being first, and then Nubia, and then Kemet. And he wrote his book again in 1971. And so the first part of his book is an absolute gem. 
it's a gym. He's dealing with specific details, you know, because here's here's where he's discussing his his approach, his method, his approach, his 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 uh, methodological approach is discussed in the first part of the book. So that's when I understood this man. This is exceptional insight, but because he didn't read the the inscriptions, he can't give he can't give the details. There. That's why he calls it Kim. It's not Kim. It's Kim. It. You know, but that's all he knew. But it doesn't take away from his overall thesis. Anecdotally, well. that's one of the reasons we're called Wose today in Wasset. Wasset, right. Exactly. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so let, let me uh, just, so he's, so anyway, he says that this is a, a great, a tragic story of how all of this knowledge was lost. Okay, so one last thing. I want to uh, share this, which I want to kind of see what you all can come up with. This is the great shake out that Diab, we call him the Pharaoh of African Studies. And um, that's mentioned. And um, so he's born in Senegal, passed in 86. And he was, uh, we would call him a multi genius chemist, linguist, mathematician, historian, uh, you, you name it, physicist, uh, physicist. So Diab was very serious about his work, to say the least. And um, so he wrote numerous books and articles on prehistory and the origins of humanity, on Kemet as an African civilization, the contributions from Kemet, and, al and also modern Africa. So my question is, I want to see what you all can come up with in terms of a list of his books or articles, whatever you might know. So uh, I, I want you to just take a minute. You can consult, consult with the person to your left, to your okay. right, front of you, behind you. French, French and English. Uh, French and English, yes. Yeah, so let's see what you come up with. <laughs> okay. A list of his books, and then, uh, oh, and then, uh, so we'll see what you come up with. And after that, then the other question is, uh, what are the eleven categories of evidence that Diab used to prove that the founders of Kemet were Black African? Now, the reason why I'm using Black African is because Diab used that, and the reason why is because some people say, yeah, okay, these people were, for them, some people argued then, and they try to argue now, that anybody that's ever lived on the African continent, they're African. So Diab said, okay, you know what, let's go beyond that. They're black Africans, uh, or Negroids. So he wanted to use the strongest language. In fact, one cat in Baltimore, he went even further. He said that they were, they were black I'm sorry, Africans. who said this? What? What's that? that anybody who lived on the continent is that that's, African? That's a, that's, a, that's a common argument. Oh, no. it's, it's a general argument. argument. Yes. It's a general argument. They live on the continent. They're African. So Diab wanted to be clear that these were not just Africans, but they're black Africans. And somebody took it even further and said they're black Africans. They're Negroes. What? <laughs> so let's so see what you come up with. Uh, what uh, list of his books? And then uh, and let's just start with that first. Let's see what you come up with. Since you all know Diab, so you don't need to get it from me. <laughs> so you tell me. So let me hide these. Okay. I came up with two. Yeah, I came up with two. Okay, let's, 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 let's give it a couple minutes. To, okay. You got two. And. Uh, I came up with one, so I should get to go first, so I don't know nobody else says. <laughs> Uh, no, no internet. <laughs> no internet. <laughs> no, no internet. Um, <laughs> the best internet. <laughs> the, the best library is the six inches between your ears. <laughs> <laughs> That's the greatest archive in the history of the world. <laughs> right there. <laughs> so his books, many books, English or French. He wrote in French, and most of his stuff still has not been translated. I have his books because when I when I travel. Like the Paris, you know, you see stuff in uh, in the bookstores there that you don't get yeah, here. I Plus, I ordered a lot of his things in English, in French too, mm -hmm. still in French from Paris. And I um, got an article. On okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, yeah. everybody, you, you, you straight? Okay, let's see what articles or books you come up with. Yes. Um, it's just that um, just reading that the book uh, in this work, which is the. Uh, the African origin and civilization myth from reality, mm -hmm. reality. Oh. Okay. In this way, he claimed the archaeological and archaeological evidence supports this Afrocentric view of the feral uh, being of Negro's origin. The academic world as a whole does not accept the theories. But they continue to raise important questions about the cultural bias inherited in scientific research. Um, okay. 
So anybody else get that? The uh, African origin of civilization, myth or reality? Okay, so that was published, that was in English in 1974. 1967 was when that was first published by Credence African. And they have a bookstore in Paris. That's where you get a lot of the materials from. So the cover, sorry, is gone. But anyway, this is it. The African origin of civilization, myth or reality. Uh, that's one of his works. And another book or um, source, article, essay. Um, I know it was uh, one called Black Africa. And then there was the cultural unity of Black Africa. Okay, anybody get that? Uh, the, the book Black Africa. The, uh, I think it's the economic political uh, basis for the for a federated state. So in black Africa, he's arguing for a united Africa, not based on rhetoric, but specific detailed cooperation in terms of building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So how are you gonna just build like a road in the ends in one country or a, rail, a, a railroad system in one country? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so yeah, black Africa, then also the cultural unity of uh, black African, anybody get that one? I got that one. The cultural unity, that's when he presents his two cradle theory of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, yeah, uh, dealing with matriarch and patriarch and sort of the two cradle theory of uh, the development of uh, human culture. Uh, uh, civilization or barbarism? Okay, civilization mm -hmm. or barbarism, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Authentic anthropology. Uh, authentic anthropology, what else? The, then there's the, the uh, paper that he and Obinga submitted to UNESCO, but I can't remember the exact title of it. Uh, okay, but that was, uh, what was the name of the conference? The, the uh, oh, actually, you know what, brother? We'll yeah. come back to that in one quick second. That, that'll yeah. be the last thing. Also, his one of his first works is, 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 is a Negro Nations and Culture, 1955, mm -hmm. volumes wow. one and two. And what Diab did, he wrote three separate PhD theses, three separate ones, to challenge the nonsense that people were promoting that Kemet was a, uh, as they were calling it in the 50s, a Caucasoid civilization. That was the mainstream position. It was a Caucasoid civilization. So everybody that had written about it had been dismissed. So volumes one and two. Uh, 1955. 55. I think this published in 55. Uh, volumes one and two here. They're, they're still in French, so... Um, it's that work, um, and he passed in 1986, and when he passed away, the great Sheikh Abdul Diop, Ivan Van Sertema edited this book, Great African Thinkers, Sheikh Abdul Diop. The man is a uh, true multi-genius, to say the least. A lot of his essays and papers are here. I mean, one that, uh, so he, he wrote a whole thesis on the origin of the ancient Egyptians, and, um, and he also wrote uh, a lot on the science. By him being a scientist, mm -hmm. he wrote a paper on Africa's contribution to world civilization, the exact sciences. So, Professor, who, yeah. um, him uh, being a chemist, how, um, what was the uh, means by which he um, proved, was it uh, uh, his study of the DNA? Yeah, he, well, uh, the melanin. So he, yeah. uh, he created the melanin doses test okay. to test the amount of melanin in the skin of a mummy. Right. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so by him being a chemist, he's able to create the, uh, the radiocarbon laboratory yeah. in Senegal. So, it's, it, so you got great African thinkers. And one thing Brother Keita was trying to remember here, and the last thing here, and he wrote many other books and articles and essays, but uh, what are the 11 categories that Diab used to prove that the founders of Kemet were African? This, this is his central argument here. And the problem that the Egyptologist has is that Diab can change hats whenever he needed to prove something. <laughs> if he needed to look at the mathematical text, he's looking at the text from the point of view of a mathematician. When he needed to change hat, now he's looking at it from the point of view of a physicist. Hmm. When he needed to change hat, now he's looking at it from the point of view of a historian. Or, hey, you know what? Let's look at linguistics. <laughs> yeah. So, they have, so they, 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 these people couldn't even hold the uh, book. So, Brother Keith had mentioned the Cairo Symposium in 1974, where Sheikh Anta Diop and my colleague uh, and our brother uh, Obinga, before the world, they presented the theory, the thesis that the people in Kemet were African. So the conference, organized by UNESCO, and I know we've got to go in a minute, but the conference was the peopling of ancient Egypt. Hmm. And it was, a, so UNESCO, the United Nations, organized this, this conference of 20 of the world's experts to argue the point of what are the rights of the people in Kemet. And so what, anybody know, can you all come up with 11 categories? Um, 
actually, um, whoever has the book Great African Thinkers, it's it's in there. Uh, One was yeah, the physical sorry. characteristics, wasn't it? Sorry. The physical characteristics based on um, images, the uh, comparative images between okay. the Greeks and the um, uh, Egyptians. Uh, did you yes. Did you use chronology or skull skull um, comparison? You use physical anthropology. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so 11 counties, you use physical anthropology because, you know, physical anthropology, they have the, uh, the indexes, for example, the, 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 the limb ratio and skull. So, so yeah, so, so he used uh, um, human images that are shown, images he used uh, one category, another category, he used his physical anthropology. No, he used the melanin evidence, content. The melanin dosage yeah. test, that's the third category. He used osteological measurements. Um, he used blood grouping. Is that a skeleton? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the skeletal, yeah, the, the, the osteological or skeletal measurements. He used blood grouping. He said the people in, uh, in Kemet belong to group B, which is consistent with West African populations. Hmm. And he argues that there's a migration from East Africa to West Africa. He used uh, another category, the Egyptian race, according to classical writers, the Greek and Roman writers who consistently said that they were African. He used categories such as the people in Kemet as they saw themselves. So that's when he discusses the word Kemet. He uses the epithet of the deities. He uses the Bible, the biblical text. So Ham had, um, had, had uh, uh, well you have, you have, have Noah had three sons, including Ham. Ham had four sons, Cush, Kemet, or uh, Mizraim, Punt, and Canaan. Mm -hmm. So he uses cultural data such as circumcision, he uses the linguistic evidence. The man goes on and on and on, 11 different categories, <laughs> and he just called this for measurement. <laughs> 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 they, they were stuck. What did they get? They couldn't even hold the man's book. So that's why we consider him a multi genius. Yeah. So, so Diab's <laughs> contributions are set in stone. Now he looks at the contributions of Kemet, but all of the people before Diab, they focused on Kush or so-called Ethiopia. So next class, what, what we'll do is, since we, we're just we're kind of ending now with Diab. Yeah, yeah. well, just quickly, uh -huh. what is the relationship, I understand that they work together, but what was the relationship between Diab and Obenga? Was it, was it mentor, student, was it mentor, student. equal peers, or it was mentor and student? It was mentor, right? student. And right. so at the Cairo Symposium, and I, I'll bring that book next time, the Cairo Symposium, Obenga told me that it was Diop who presented all the work. He was just there. <laughs> uh, because uh, Obinga is mainly a linguist. Mainly a linguist. So his linguistic, because the, the conference is the people in the title, the people in ancient Egypt, as the main part of the conference. But the other second part of the conference is the deciphering of the Meroitic script. And that's when Obinga emerges in the conference. He said uh, that when, uh, when Diop comes in the room, everybody's quiet. Just a, he had that kind of presence, <laughs> and he said he could sit and eat lunch with them at the conference and be cordial. But when it came time to present the so evidence, what? everybody who was in opposition to him was an academic enemy and an opponent. So wow. he took no prisoners. He didn't even take their name. He just whooped academic behind. <laughs> and that's, what he <laughs> that's what he did. So, so, so lastly, so, so lastly, uh, let's see. This is my right up on. But, but lastly, UNESCO said this, to show you what Obinga and Diop did at this Cairo Symposium, they said that although the preparatory working paper sent out by UNESCO gave particulars of what was desired, not <coughs> all participants had prepared communications comparable with the painstakingly researched contributions of Professor Sheikh Diop and Obinga. There was consequence, uh, consequently a real lack of balance in the discussions. In other words, what they mean to say, there was an academic butt kicking on an international <laughs> scale. Yes. That's, that's the way to put it. So exactly. they emerged triumphant in 1974. So lastly, what happened was that these people promoting the Caucasian idea, they quietly stopped promoting it, and then they retreated to a new position. They said, yeah, we agree with the, uh, the, the, uh, the way of thinking was African, the culture was African, the writing was African, but the people themselves were mixed. So they came up with a new position yeah. with no yeah. evidence. Yeah. So they, wow. they shipped from Caucasoid yeah. to mixed race in 1974. And as a UNESCO observer said, 
there was a tacit agreement not to mention the Caucasian origin anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> this is why we put it here. So, okay. So, right. so that's an appropriate fitting title, Carol. The, 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 the Carol of African yeah. Studies. Yeah, so, yeah, in, right. so, so, so in two weeks we had to go because of the time, but in two weeks we'll we'll look at those historians that have made contributions regarding Kemet. Yeah. So we established Kush first, but we had to look at Kemet. So I thought it'd be good to start with. Okay. So uh, see, so if you can come in with the names of individuals who've made contributions to Kemet. Some of you already mentioned, you mentioned Ben and a few other people, Ben Clark and some other people. Also, I want to say what Woodson had to say about Kemet as well. So that'll be on the 24th in uh, two weeks. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today, March 10th, is the day that uh, Harriet Tubman transitioned, so it's a very important day to me. Mm -hmm. And they just, they just, uh, 1913, wasn't it? 1913. Yeah, there was a park or something that was just... Okay. 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 Morgan State, right? No excuse. I wasn't sure either. Thank you. 